to consider. To look where you've been and to also look where you're going. One of the things I've maintained, and particularly when it comes to the subject of increase in financial prosperity, and particularly the place of God's word in my life, is that when things are not working for me, the first place I look, or the first person I look to, is me. Now, I know that many people have the mindset to blame God. Why haven't you done this? Why didn't you do this? And I've trusted you all these years. But I look to me first. And I ask, is there anything that I should have done that I have not done? Is there anything that I'm doing that I shouldn't do? Is there anything, any steps I need to take? And this is what has helped me greatly in life. That I'm constantly looking behind and also looking ahead. Because your future is predicated upon your past and your today. And I'm sure that's clear for you to understand. And I'm not talking about your past in the sense of the past that is under the blood of Jesus. But I'm talking about the fact that the, your actions of today determine your future. So even your seeds of yesterday and today are going to come to full harvest for you. So if you want a great future, it means you've got to begin to do things today that would precipitate or bring that future into reality. Let me read a scripture to you this morning from Proverbs chapter 24 verse 7. And it's, it's, it's an interesting scripture, but I believe that it's one that you will be blessed by. It says, wisdom is too high for a fool. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. It's, it, I, I, I think you should put it this way. Say, I, I pray that he's not talking about you. I, I believe God that he's not talking about you. We were returning from Lagos with Pastor Bestman yesterday. And he, well, while we were there, he was having a conversation Well called his wife and he called her by a name that he normally wouldn't call her by. Me love. That's his own expression. I won't tell you what he used to call her before. But he said this to me. He said there was a time we were having a consideration in church on marriage and I remember addressing the issue of what you call your wife. It may not mean much to you to call your wife sweet names, but it means a lot to her. Um, <laughs> my, my, I remember my parents, you know, to be honest with you, they didn't use such sweet words as much as they loved each other. My, my, my older brother is called Benga, and my f mother used to call my father Baba Benga. <laughs> that's, that's Benga's father. I mean, that's just, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what my dad used to call my mom. Because suddenly I can't even remember. <laughs> but there were no sweet words like honey and dear. And he said to me, he said, from the day I heard that message, I stopped calling my wife by her nickname or whatever it was. And I chose a name. Isn't that right? Now, why I'm saying this is that when you are not quick to respond to the word of God, the word of God does not take root in you. And you would find out that it's not effective in you. Wisdom is too high for a fool. What it means is that every time wisdom comes, a fool will circumnavigate it, would go around it, go under it, go on top of it, 
and find a reason to avoid the words of wisdom that's coming to them. Wisdom is too high for a fool. He opens not his mouth in the gate. Now, this, this takes it one step forward. If you understand the significance of the gate, you would know, and I've shared this before, that city gates were very prominent and were a place of note for transactions, for business, for negotiations, for cutting covenant or making an oath, and all kinds of things. You would find out about the Proverbs 31 woman that the Bible says that her husband is known at the gate. If you read about Ruth and Boaz, the transaction was at the city gate. If you read about Job and all the things that he said about himself and how whenever he showed up, the young men would stand up and even the old men and, and they would seal their mouths because of the, the wisdom that came out of his mouth. All that took place at the city gate. If you go back to a couple of messages and I, I can't remember the, the, what I titled this message, but I was talking about, uh, I think it was a prayer meeting where I was talking about entering the gates of the city. And I was sharing about the fact that you can be in a city, but yet you are not in the city. In other words, everything is happening around you and you're not a part of what is happening. Are you getting what I'm saying? So you're in the city, but you're not in the city. You don't understand how the city runs you don't know what drives the economy you don't know what even drives the spiritual environment if i ask you what drives the spiritual environment of abuja what would be your response money <laughs> i don't know about swagger but all kinds of lost and inordinate affection that's what drives the environment but it can be here and yet not know what you need to fight or stand against and not even know how you need to navigate your course in the city the book of proverbs says to us that the labor of the foolish wearies him because he does not know the way to the city. Now, that doesn't mean he's not in the city, but he doesn't know the, he, he's not engaging the city positively in order to impact the city or to derive benefits from the city. So the, 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 the man, and that's the scripture, the labor of the foolish, where is every one of them because he knows not how to go to the city. I think it was two Sundays ago I was sharing, having come back from a trip I made to Mina, and I said, you know, my consideration on that trip, and, and, and that's the power of considering. My people do not consider is what Isaiah chapter 1 says, and that has been our text. The consideration I had then was that when I was an undergraduate, there was no one to show me how to go to the city. I remember when I moved off campus and I was renting what you call room and parlor. Um, that was two years after, after being in, in the university. I, I, I remember vividly that I came out one day and I thought, I considered, there was a thought in my mind. Why don't you buy land and build accommodation for students? Now, I had a neighbor whose name um, Stunde and he married, you know, one of my daughters in the faith within that environment. And I went to him and I said, look, how can I buy land? At least I took some steps. And he said, well, he was going to get back in touch with me and whatever, whatever. But, you know, beyond that point, I didn't get a response from him. There was no other person I could connect with. There was no other person who had done what I was trying to do. So as much as I was in the city, that was a way in the city for me, but there was no one to show me. 
And I said, you know, to, to Collins who went with me and, and Queen as well, and I said, I wish there had been someone who would have held my hand and guided me in that path, I would have been so tremendously blessed by that initiative. Many times in life, all we need is someone to guide our hands. But you see, the other flip side, which takes me back to Proverbs 24, 7, is that wisdom is too high for a fool. That many times when you find a guiding hand, you will still be questioning the guiding hand. That happens a lot. I feel like passing some decrees in Lighthouse. You know the kind of decrees? Decrees like in the next six months to be a member of Lighthouse, you must move from where you are and begin to put a business or an income generating initiative on ground. I mean, that's a good decree for foundation school. It's not just foundation school. But everybody must do something. Now, you may say, I have a job. Fantastic. But beyond that job, look, engage this mind. Are you getting what I'm saying? Put it to more productive use. The people who are making great impact around you are not more intelligent than you. But the fact that or the difference is while you are sleeping, they're on their beds as well. But they're considering. And you know it is in those contemplative moments that the Spirit of God puts ideas on the inside of you. What was Isaac doing when his bride, Rebecca, came? He was out there in the field considering and contemplating and there comes Rebecca saying who is that man in the field and I talked about the power of meditation and contemplation we, we, we fail to realize how much the Holy Spirit wants to put ideas on the inside of us that did I touch something oh hallelujah it's not book it's not Boko Haram hallelujah see that that just made me lose How much the Holy Spirit wants to put thoughts, ideas, and creative concepts on the inside of you. But because you fail and you live life without considering, he can't infuse your thoughts and your mind with his creative ability. That's just a warm up. Let me share with you today on walking the path of honor. You need to get rid of that noise as quickly as possible, please. I know it's not a regular place of meeting, but we're having to make do with what we have. So say to your neighbor, walking the path of honor. Let's turn to Romans chapter 13.
Are you there? Romans chapter 13, and I'd love to read from verse 7. I know you know what all of this says. Let every soul be subject to higher powers and so on and so forth. Um, let's read from verse 1. Let's read from verse 1 so that we can gain wisdom. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. We make a mistake very often when we, <laughs> a politician, I think it was Jonah Jang, who said, let me remember how he said it. He said, rigging elections may not be right. But if you succeed, it's the will of God. <laughs> In other words, he allowed it to work. Can God raise a person to leadership? Yes, he can. But when the Bible speaks about governing authorities that have been ordained by God, there's much more, much more credence and illumination and truth to the fact that the seats of government are God-ordained. There is no government but of God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because if not, you would think... There have been some tyrants who have ruled upon the face of the earth. You think a bachelor was called of God <laughs> and so many things. Are you getting what I'm saying? You think God is, is, is the one who established him. Now, that does not mean God can establish a person. But if we read that scripture within the light of truth, take me back to verse 1. That's, that's where I still am. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So in society, you're going to find seats of governmental authority and all of that structure is God-ordained. Let's go to verse 2. Therefore, who resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring themselves on to or bring judgment on to themselves. Now, and that's not even where I'm going. I don't have to like the president, but I need to respect him. I can keep my dislike um, to myself. Left to me, when I look at our political system, there's some people that should be in jail. And some of them are ministers of the Federal Republic. Locked up, key thrown away. Not just thrown away, but thrown in the pits of hell. Because they do not represent change as far as I'm concerned. But because they occupy a seat of authority, I give them respect because they occupy it doesn't change my opinion about where they belong. And I don't need to call names. Because one may be your uncle. <laughs> but don't be bothered. All of this will work out for the good of Nigeria. It will work out for our good. Verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Is that true? That is, that is what is ideal. Rulers are not a terror to good works. In Nigeria...
when you decide to turn the path of good, you find great opposition because they are not towing the part of truth of good. Now, when when scripture puts this there, there's a reason why. Because God is painting an ideal picture. And he's not going to adjust his ideal because men choose to violate the you know truth and the path of justice. Uh, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you would have praise from the same. Hmm. Don't want, let's, let's leave that. <laughs> for he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay what? Taxes. For they are ministers. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Have you pay taxes? It's, it's, it's default. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. <laughs> because before you, you get your pay, the taxes have already been deducted but <laughs> if you don't pay taxes you have no right to say what are they doing with our money yeah. unless you're a taxpayer But this is the path of honor. The path of honor simply requires of you to do the things that are necessary or required for you to do whether or not you are under observation by spiritual naturally natural authority or under observation by people are you getting what i'm saying so let's with this in mind let's look at what the scripture says render therefore to all that due taxes to whom taxes are due custom to whom customs are due and this is not talking about nigerian customs this is talking about the fact that every society has its own customs and has its own value system and therefore within the context of that there are certain requirements of you there's there's a saying that you don't go visit your father-in-law to be and when you're meeting him for the first time, you bring out your hand. Particularly if it's from your village. And I didn't mention that village. I know, you know, um, my sister-in-law's um, uncle. There was a young man who was coming to marry from the family and he would be the next governor and the day the young man came he just stood and said how you doing <laughs> they've been married for over 12 years and that thing is working against his good till today <laughs> uh, 
as long as custom and tradition does not violate the word of God, you need to render custom to who custom is due and not try to change the customs of people. Are you getting what I'm saying? I'm learning certain things. I'm learning to be very, um, I don't know, spiritually cultured. The wedding yesterday, I was surrounded by bishops. I think about nine or ten of them. And one came in a stretched Hummer. That's, that's his regular car. When he stepped out, they put a red carpet for him. And he sat next to me. And I was to preach yesterday. And one mind said to me, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I considered my ways. <laughs> because there's some things that shouldn't be in the body of Christ. A man of God is still man at its very best. Let's leave that. So I gave honor. <laughs> custom to who custom is due. Fear to whom fear is due. Is it only God we fear? You must fear spiritual authority. Not necessarily because the man is going to come down on you and he's going to curse and rain fire and brimstone upon you. But because when you step out of your context within his flow of grace towards you you get into territories where you may become a prey for the enemy the bible says god in ephesians chapter 4 has set some in the church now i know that men set themselves that's that's not those i'm referring to but God set some in the church and he set them as ministries within the church. And we must recognize those whom God has set and line up and key up with the grace of God so that it can benefit us and also be careful not to get too familiar with the anointed. Yeah, you, won't, you won't understand what I'm saying. If not, one day you will say to the anointed, uh, you know, when, when you pee, you should pee to the front and not to the left. I know I'm being extreme. I'm using... Honor to whom honor is due. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Say to your neighbor, oh, no one anything except to love one another. Now turn to Psalm 37 and verse 21. There is a culture among believers that needs to die today. So I'm here as an undertaker <laughs> whose assignment is to bury certain things 
if they exist in your life. The wicked borrows and does not repay. I turn to your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about borrowing with repayment terms arranged or structured. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the man who borrows and has no intention of paying back. God calls you the wicked. If we run right through scripture to look at the lot of the wicked, let's, let's leave that, but you know. I'm not the one saying it. The wicked borrows and does not repay. But the righteous shows mercy and gives. Now, when I, in trying to link this with Romans chapter 13, let me establish that the path of honor is the path of increase. And all of that is summed up from Romans chapter 13 with the words we read, Oh, no man, anything except love. That's where God wants you to be. That ultimately, you will not be a debtor to anyone. If you're a debtor for anything, you owe people love and you must pay it. Let me share with you from my own experience in life. Because the journey you're taking is a journey of many days. The race you are running is a long distance race. And the way you relate to money is indicative of your character. If a man cannot be trusted with money, can be trusted with anything, not even power. As a rock, take note. If a person violates the rules of money and the order of wealth, that person cannot be trusted with power, even if he says, trust me. Can't. Can you imagine what would have happened to Judas Iscariot if he had transcended the crucifixion of Christ to become one of the pillars of the church? You see that late at the apostles' feet? that the early church did, he would have been the... I'm considering something. So, <laughs> they'll be laying money at his feet every day of meeting. Can't trust a person who is inconsistent with the way they handle money with authority and power. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? But here is where rubber meets the road. In my years in ministry, I found lots of believers lack honor in the way they handle money, particularly when they borrow. A majority of them borrow without the intention of paying back. And what they don't realize is how that eventually affects your prosperity. And how it at the end of the day diffuses every good thing that God is out to do in your life. 
So whereas you're pointing fingers and saying, Lord, I've been doing this, I've been doing that, I've been doing X, Y, Z, uh, but I can't see why it's working. This is the word of the Lord to you today. Change your ways. Say to your neighbor, change your ways. Is a deliberate reason why this word is coming. Because if you must prosper and you must be relevant and recommended by heaven in the days that are to come, you need to change your ways if your ways have been wrong. Have I borrowed money before? Let, let me, let me let, I'll share two stories with you. I was ministering at the P, a PFN conference in Kaduna. I think it was about 10 years ago. And here was I preaching. I can't even remember what I was talking about, but it, it had nothing to do with money. I met a young man afterwards who came to my office and he said, Pastor, I want to see you. So he sat down in my office and he began to tell me his story. What was his story? He said, you were preaching and you convicted me by what you said. And I said, what did I say? And when he shared what I said, it had no correlation with the conviction. And that tells you that the Holy Ghost can move beyond words and can impact you and bring conviction to you. And this is the story. A pastor and his wife started a church and they took him in. I mean, he was a wanderer, a nobody really. He didn't have a place to stay and they took him in as a son. And having been with them for a while, they put the offering in his hands. Now, while he was with them, they were paying his school fees and they were giving him some monthly stipend just for his upkeep. And he was living with them. But the spirit of Judas came on him. And he began to take from the offering. And in that meeting, something I said convicted him. So he came to me to confess. And I said, well, confession is a first step towards, you know, repentance or the, and, and all of that. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to them and go tell them what you've been doing. And he said, Pastor, that's, they're going to kick me out. I said, trust God. If you walk that path of honor, Let's see what God will do. So he went back to them and sat them down. And he said, well, thank you for accepting me and all. But in the last couple of years, this is what I've been doing. And they were shocked because they didn't know. And they said, well, we appreciate the fact that you came to tell us. We will take the purse from you. We won't kick you out of the house because you came and owned up. We will increase your monthly stipend. We will continue to pay your school fees. And he came back to thank me. Because all his fears were suddenly allayed completely. Because he walked the path of honor. That's story number one. This story you've heard before. It happened about nine years ago. I had a business initiative I needed to raise 30 million naira for. I had some of the money. And God dropped the name of a friend in my heart and I went to see him to share my dream and my vision with him. When I shared it, he said to me, he said, I'll give you five million as a gift I'll give you 15 million as a loan interest free payable when able what does that mean no let's let's start from there because I, I need, what what does that mean anytime you are able it could be 2 years it could be 5 years the problem however is that when the tenor elongates and gets into a certain number of years a dishonorable person will say the man has forgotten mm. 
That's what you dishonor every person will say. How, how can you be remembering death for that long? Haba. Have you ever owed the banks and wished that the branch caught fire? Uh, you, 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 the, the, the thought just comes to your mind that they, it will do, all the papers will be burnt. And you keep wishing and it never gets burnt. After about 18 months, I, I think it was about 18 months, I went to see him because I had part of the money and I didn't have the balance. And I needed to say, Hey, this is where I am. I know it's payable when able. I need a bit of time. And when I went to him, he said to me, Pastor, you're not owing me anything. And that was a shock to me. He said, what do you mean? He said, I have a list, a book where I write those who owe me. And your name is not there. The day I gave you that 20 million, it was a gift. Now, if he knew it was a gift, why did he tempt me? Why didn't he just say it was a gift and I would go on, you know, but he said 5 million was a gift, 15 million was a loan, interest fee, people when able. When people test you, Will you pass the test? Will you pass the test? Or will you just walk on false assumptions like, does he really need the money? What difference will it make? If I, if I go and give it back to him. It may be 100,000 naira. Uh, how much is 50,000 naira? By now he has forgotten. Even if the person has forgotten. It is honorable to go back and say. Can you remember. This amount of money you gave me. And let the person say. Oh I've forgotten. And leave it open if he says, I still need my money back. The path of honor for the sake of your future life and for the heavens to pour out upon you, walk the path of honor. It's better to go and say, can you give me more time? Can you give me one more year? And even if that one year has expired and you've not been able to redeem it, can you give me just six more months? In church, let me tell you what the trend is. And I will mention names because they're, they're gone. When you see people leave church, there's always a reason. And the reason often is not what they tell you. Trust me. Some have collected money. They've refused to pay back. And then when Pastor Ayo calls them, you, you see, that's the problem about being a debtor. Because when you're owing, and particularly when you're not doing the path of honor, when the person you are owing calls you, your heart will jump. You say, he's calling me now because I'm owing him. My father has a principle that may not necessarily be scriptural, but it works for him. And he told me, he said, when my friends come to borrow money from me, from him, he says, look, if you come and you say you want a million naira, he'll, he'll look at you and say, here's 200,000 naira. It is a gift. Don't pay back. Reason? If I give you one million and you can't pay back, you start avoiding me. When I start calling you, you say I'm harassing you. So that our friendship will not be destroyed. Take this as a gift. Don't pay back. It has worked for him. Because many of us lose people. Not because we are at fault, but because the people themselves 
who do not walk the path of honor. Can we go deeper? Ecclesiastes. When God says, Oh, no man, anything, is not just talking about money. This doesn't sound like a good message for a day like this. Pastor Gabriel said we should do what? We should believe. You want God to bless you? You can be violating one principle and then expecting a promise from another. You can be dishonorable towards money and be expecting him to bless and increase you. Listen to me. I would rather the whole world owes me than to owe anybody. Can I say this to you? That I never forget my commitments to people. About eight years, I don't think it was, it was about eight years ago. I remember going to Mina and I made a commitment at Pastor Joshua's church. Time went on. It will go, it will come. It will go, it will come. But I eventually fulfilled my commitment. I don't forget my financial commitments. It may delay. It may tarry. Wait for it. It will not tarry. It will surely come. Are you getting what I'm saying? And the next scripture I'm reading has to do with that. <laughs> like it says, it's chapter 5. Uh, have this culture of you just say anything, promise anything. In my years, I, I'll give you statistics and any of the pastors can tell you. In my years in ministry, and this, this has not changed. Whenever commitments, financial commitments or pledges are taken for a project, the best that comes in is 70% of it. So if you're raising 10 million naira, the best is 7 million. And I'm talking about best. Many times it doesn't even get to that. And yet people can feel slips on paper. I mean, feel f figures on, on paper and submit it and they just walk away and never redeem their commitments and they say well god understands let's find out if he does hmm? verse one uh, maybe we're reading the, in, let's read in the King James translation. I, I kind of like, we'll read a couple of translations this morning. Keep your foot when you go to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. So the question is, what's the sacrifice of fool? One whose ears are not inclined to what is being said and who believes that he can appease God just by what he has? For they consider not that they do evil. Let's look at it in the message translation. It's lengthy, but, 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 but we'll learn a lot here. Watch your step when you enter God's house. Enter to learn. That's far better than mindlessly offering a sacrifice 
doing more harm than good. Now, the word that I want to anchor on is mindlessly, which means that when you offer sacrifices or gifts, it should not be mindless. It should be well thought through. Don't make, a, don't commit to what you're not willing to fulfill. And this is beyond church. Because we make personal commitments to one another. Don't worry, I'll do it for you and then you end up not doing it. Next verse. Don't shoot off your mouth or speak before you think. <laughs> Give me the new King James. Let's start from there and then come here. Don't be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. Don't, God doesn't want you. Look, the euphoria of the moment can become a snare to you. Read Acts chapter 5 and learn about Ananias and Sapphira. There was a move of the spirit in the local assembly. And people, that's where the apostles' feet thing came from. And people were coming and they would sell their land and they would bring all the proceeds to the apostles' feet. And that doesn't mean apostles were standing to say, okay, drop it at my feet. It means under their authority. And that's what it means. So they were selling. They they also, Ananias, and they also got excited. Christianity is not emotional. Now, you may feel some emotions, but emotions don't drive your Christian life because the day you don't feel any emotion, you will think God has left you. I get what I'm saying. That's why people, you know, goosebumps. Oh, church was good today. And then you get back home and you've forgotten what was said. So they also said, ah, people, guess what's happening? People are selling and they are bringing everything. And they said, we too will sell our land. And the apostles said, great, go sell and bring. When they got home and the emotional sensationalism of the moment went down, and then I asked, called his wife Sapphira and said, Honey, how far now? Uh, can we reconsider that thing? And that wasn't bad in itself. They sold it and they brought the money. And Peter stood up because he came first. And, and Ananias came first. How much did you sell the land? Five million there. And he said, why did Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, you know, the whole, see, you, you don't get something. The Holy Spirit was not there. It was Peter. I'm going somewhere with it. When they lied, they thought they were lying to Peter. But because it was a move of the Spirit, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And here is what Peter said. Why did you allow Satan to feel your heart? Fell down and died. Here comes Sapphira. I don't know if they had children. She showed up. Hey, Peter, how are you doing? How much did you sell the land? She discounted it. You too. The feet of those who went to bury your husband is at the door. She fell down and died. You know what happened after that? Great fear filled the church. Those who are fake disciples withdrew themselves. And they said, if people are dying in this church, <laughs> Pastor Ayo, take back your foundation school certificate. <laughs> take me back to Ecclesiastes. 
Be not rash with your mouth. Let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven. You are upon the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Next verse. For a dream comes through a multitude of business and a fool's voice is known how? By the multitude of words. When you vow a vow to God, defer not to pay it, for God has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you vowed. Better is it that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. I need in the New King James, the next verse, verse 6. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God, it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? So ultimately what happens when you don't walk the path of honor, the work of your hands gets destroyed. Hey, guy, you have holes in your pocket. You say, but pastor, my pocket does not have holes. You're traveling one day, your engine knocks. I tell you, it cost you 600,000 naira to change the engine. Your vow was 200,000. You spent three times more. Those are the holes, leakages. Driver takes the car, has an accident, they write off the car, and it wasn't insured. Okay, it was, third party. <laughs> your sin is the devil? No, check yourself. Check yourself. Did your mouth utter things rashly? Did you make commitments or are you in the habit of making commitments and just glossing over and say, that one not talk, that one I'm out. And what did somebody call it? Poopy gymnastics. Motivating people to give. Where you say, we're raising money, raising 100 million naira. The man of God will come up and say, I'm giving 10. So that can motivate other people to give. Then he does not fulfill his own commitment. Says it's, it's faith booster. I know it's a solemn assembly, but honestly, this is the best birthday gift I can give you. Consider your ways and change your ways. You want to be blessed? This is the path of honor. In your relationships, if I would rather allow someone cheat me and for me to cheat someone else. You can cheat all you want. If they ask you for your cloak, what did Jesus say? Give them your coat. If a man says, let's go one mile, what do you do? Go two miles with him. That's the, the, the law of the kingdom. That you can go the extra mile. That, And I'm not saying you become one that people just rob in broad daylight. But instead of someone saying... You cheated me. Take everything and go with it. We'll compare notes in three years. We'll compare notes. I shared the story of Dr. Falope, who we had ministered to us last year at the men's convention. 
started a drilling business. It's a dear friend. Started a drilling, uh, a water, um, what do they call it? Oh. Yes. Hydro, geology, whatever they call And his son, his friend's son, he's not a geologist, but he had the contacts. His friend's son came to serve with him. And he said, look, why can't he also become a director in the company? So he put him on the board. And they started having all kinds of projects and they were drilling for water and all of that. <laughs> There's something about youth. There's a danger of youth. Foolishness abounds in the heart it's not just of a child, of an uncultured young man. Went to him one day, because Dr. Falopa is a prudent man. This young man was spending everything. So Dr. Falopa built a house, and when he went to the dedication, he said, God, this man has been cheating me. Let's split the company, the path of honor. Both of them belong to the Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship. And Dr. Falopa said, I don't want to be a part of the splitting process. We'll hand it over to the full gospel business men's fellowship. Check all the assets, divide it any way you want. Abraham and Lot. Oh God. God had increased them greatly. And there was strife between the herdsmen. So they came to agreement. Let, let there not be strife between us. Choose anywhere you want, and it is yours. Lot, you see the foolishness of youth. Custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due. When you are with an older person and you are to make a choice, let the older man choose. I remember I was flying a local flight. It, it happened to me a couple of times. I'm in business class. I remember seeing my wife's sister's husband. What's that? Is it, is it brother-in-law too? Because some of these things confuse me. Maybe that's why some people, just to defend, they say, my cousin sister. And cousin brother. <laughs> cousin. <laughs> If you say Esther, my cousin, I know it's female. Yeah. Down to say cousin sister. Say Chijuke, my cousin. <laughs> Unless it's Kathleen and Bruce. <laughs> so here am I sitting down. And he walks past and I, hey, hi, Shola, and all. And he walks back and he's in economy. I say, God forbid. Go to him, sir. Go and sit in my seat. I'll sit here. No, 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 no. Go and sit. Same thing happened with my father-in-law too. Did they write it in a book? I know if it's you. Say levels, levels don't change. I pray that you would have a deep sense of respect for those who are older than you. If Lot had just said, Abraham, you're my father, because his own father was dead, you're my father, choose for me. Whatever you choose is mine. The man looked with the eyesight of youth 
and saw a land that looked so good. Said, I choose. Abraham said, you've chosen go. By the time he'll return, he had 70 kg of salt. That he came back with. If he had only deferred to the aged. So they split the assets. And whatever was given to him, he took. And he started building his business all over again. Five years down the line, the young man had sold everything was out of business couldn't find a bear in his life in life the same five years everything that was taken away from him had been restored from doctor you know to, back to dr falope there are principles that are not necessarily written in black and white ink you may not see it but they work. You want my coat? Take it. The one who gave the coat can do exceeding abundantly above. But I will be written that I took your coat. God forbid. Give me that Ecclesiastes 5 in the message and let's read it completely um, the message translation take me back to two verses I'll soon be done when you tell God you do something do it now God takes no pleasure in foolish gabble vow it then do it far better not to vow in the first place than to vow and not pay up. Don't let your mouth make a total sinner of you. When called to account, you won't get by with, sorry, I didn't mean it. Why risk provo provoking God to angry retaliation? But against all illusion and fantasy and empty talk, there's always this rock foundation. Fear God. This is another interesting one. Don't be too upset when you see the poor kicked around and justice and right violated all over the place. Exploitation filters down from one petty official to another. There's no end to it and nothing can be done about it. It will continue to happen. So the nation must keep fighting it. Say to your neighbor, watch your mouth. Watch the commitment you make to people. <laughs> Watch your commitments. The path of honor is to owe no man anything. Ask your neighbor, who do you owe? Starting from God. It's not just giving that is the key to increase. Honor in and walking honorably in your finances is also the twin brother to the key to increase. Ecclesiastes says, why would you allow God to destroy the work of your hands? If you read it in the King James, it says, when you vow, are you not afraid of the angel of God, the New King James translates it as messenger of God. You may lose it there or the import of it there. Aren't you afraid of the angel of God when you connect that with the book of Hebrews chapter 1? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us who will be heirs of salvation? So angels minister for us. And they just don't minister in the area of deliverance. They also minister to us in the area of finances. It's an 
all-encompassing ministry that they have towards us. So when your words and your heart do not align, and you're one who keeps making promises that you violate, you actually stifle the ministry of angels. They can therefore do no mighty works towards you. My prayer as I close this morning is that you would choose to walk the high ground. And the high ground is the path of honor. I pray someone has been blessed. So say to someone, oh, no man anything. God requires one debt of you. It's called the debt of love. That's the only thing you're permitted to owe. Uh, I believe that the people here today who need to repent. Because 